morning, everyone. You're all awake enough for some security? Good enough. <laughs> all right. So, why do we still use passwords? A single phrase that we tend to forget and is supposed to protect our accounts and our data with it. And for some reason, we trust all of those websites, services, companies with our password and for them to keep it safe. How do we get to that point? For that, I want to go back roughly 20 years, around the same time these movies came out. Back then, we saw that a lot of websites started to require you registering an account, especially when online shopping was becoming a real big thing. If you wanted to buy a product, you needed to register an account, and with that, come up with a password. And we did that with passwords like this. And back then we thought, okay, a password is something I made up. So it's something I know and is safe. And we as developers took that password when a user registers. We store it in the database, sometimes even in plain text. And then this malicious party comes into play and somehow gets a hold of the database and leaks all of those passwords online. Huge problem, of course. And it happens still on a weekly basis. But at that point, developers thought, okay, maybe we should at least, you know, try to secure these passwords before we, you know, store them somewhere. But unfortunately, we as humans are only capable of remembering so many things. So what do we do? We reuse our passwords, because we can remember them. But even though this website has done everything they can to make sure that our passwords are safe, our password is already leaked on the internet. And with that, how much this website has done for security, it doesn't matter, because your account is already compromised on all of these different websites if we keep reusing our password. So we started to, as users, come up with all of these elaborate things, like Troubadour and replacing the O with a zero, or was it a capital O? And apparently we thought this is something that the malicious parties cannot guess that easily. But in the end, we also made it more difficult for ourselves, because how can we remember such things? And brute forcing, pretty easy to guess these things. And with password policies where we're forced to use one letter, one number, a capital letter, a special character, we're actually just giving these malicious parties the exact parameters to fine tune their brute forcing. So then what did we do? We come up with long phrases eh, like correct horse battery staple something that is more easy to remember and harder to guess as the password is longer. So we give that password. Wait, was it battery correct horse staple or horse battery? Indeed, we get to the next thing. We forget our passwords and we bother our developers with creating these password forget flows and have to take care of Things like, why do these mails constantly get into our spam boxes? As I mentioned, password policies, we have to keep on improving them and make sure that our users renew their passwords every three months or so. But these things don't make passwords more secure. And in the end, a malicious party will either brute force or even get the password before it even hits the server with phishing attacks. Now, fortunately, there are organizations that are trying to help us, like websites Have I Been Pwned, where we can look up all the major leaks that have happened over the years and look up passwords 
phone numbers, emails, all of those things that have been leaked. And with that, making it a bit more secure for us to at least not use that same password again. But I ask myself the question time and time again, what are we doing? Why are we still so inclined to use passwords? Because in the end, we're asking users a lot. We're asking them every time to think of another password, to remember them. And for developers, we're forcing them to work on these features that they don't care about. They want to work on features that actually bring value to their product. And in the end, they will find a way to get that password. And the reason why they do that, why they can get to our password, is because we are sharing our secret. How can something be a secret if we're sharing it? It's like me giving my front door key to a complete stranger, asking him to open the door for me, and then letting him keep it safe. Would you trust someone like that? I hope the answer is no. <laughs> so, can, can't we make these things easier for users and developers alike? Because, as we can see, even the great wizard sometimes forgets the password. I'm Mark van der Linde, and I'm a software architect and developer advocate at I.O. Now, we have come a long way from using passwords like welcome123. Well, I can imagine that some people still use that, unfortunately. But we have done a lot of things to make it easier for users and developers. And one example of that is single sign-on. A mechanism where we provide the users to have a single account and be able to log into multiple kinds of websites. And we can do that by either leveraging the big tech, like Google, Apple, Microsoft, or use things like single sign-on products that we can implement quite easily. And with that, users can just with a click of a button, log in. And usually don't even have to provide a password because they already have a session at, for example, Google. And with that, we also mitigate kind of the amount of phishing attacks that uh, can occur as they don't have to provide their password as often. And the other thing is that is single sign-on solutions usually are based on open standards like OAuth and OpenID Connect. And with open standards, as we all know, we get a great ton of support, libraries, SDKs, or even out-of-the-box solutions. And with that, developers can actually focus on implementing it and not focus on the complex stuff behind it. And with that, can focus really on bringing the functionality, secure authentication. And by using the services of big tech, we can actually, as developers, kind of delegate that responsibility of making sure that password is safe to these bigger companies. And you can imagine that these bigger companies like Google have quite a lot of resources that they can put into security. And that can be quite a formidable opponent for these malicious parties. Now, unfortunately, that's not the whole story, of course, because if you're starting to use single sign-on, and especially with these big tech companies, you can imagine that users might not always want to use it and might not always want to attach every single website that they use to that single account, especially if we're talking about sensitive data. And for developers, even though the developers using these services, we can delegate that responsibility, but of course, at Google, they also still have developers that need to take care of that password. So we're still dealing with it. And to make it even worse, if by however means they get your password, they have access to all of those accounts that are attached to that single account. But fortunately, there are things that we can do to at least mitigate some of these attacks especially phishing attacks that are still very relevant these days. And we can do that by adding an additional step to our authentication flow, by for instance, one-time passwords. And with that, we create a second barrier that the malicious party will have to go through. 
And over time, this has become kind of a standard, especially with websites that contain sensitive data. And the awareness of users have become, uh, has been increasing. And they're kind of um, willing to enable the, this if it is required by a website. And as this has been around for a very long time, developers also can again use SDKs, out-of-the-box solutions to enable this. And of course, malicious parties will have to do some extra work as they now also need that one-time password. A code that is only usable for usually 30 seconds and can only be used once. There are downsides, of course. I'm not saying you shouldn't activate it, because you all should. But unfortunately, not all users do it. And especially if this is not a requirement of a website. Because not a lot of users go into the options and search for that functionality, as a lot of people still think that their password that they made up is safe enough. And even though we have enabled this, we didn't really do anything about that password. That password is still there. So it can still be fished, can still be retrieved in some way or another. And they can enable or and they can use it on other accounts that don't have a one-time password attached to it. Because we're still reusing our passwords. And even though the malicious party has to do a lot more, they can also still do a phishing attack on one-time passwords. If they can make a exact copy of a login form of Google, they can do the same with that one-time password field. No problem. So there are solutions that allow for a authentication flow where we don't need a password. One of those examples is a magic link where you just provide your uh, email and you get sent an email with a link in there. But these things are usually used as a second step in the authentication and not as an only step. And the other problem I have with this is that we're actually kind of delegating the responsibility of keeping a password safe to the mail service. Because guess what? That mail service probably is protected with a... Exactly. Now, the other thing that is possible is by having a separate app where you get a push notification to approve your authentication. And a perfect example of that is the Get GitHub app. But there also it's enabled as a second step in your authentication. And for GitHub this makes sense as they already have a application that provides other kinds of functionality. But I can't imagine that a simple web shop that just sells a bunch of products is going to spend time on making a specific app for both iOS and Android just to make sure that their users have a safe way to authenticate. So with all of these things I just mentioned, what we're actually just trying to do is to verify the identity of a user. And we can do that with three things. And ideally, we would always like to have two of those things, hence the two-factor authentication. The first one is something the user knows. So, of course, a password. The second one is something that they own. It can be either a laptop or a phone. And the last one is something that they are. So with biometrics, your fingerprint or your face for facial recognition. And these three things are actually the, the, the pillar of what an organization has been using to create a more secure specification or rather a protocol. And that organization is called the FIDO Alliance. And the FIDO Alliance kind of has the same goal as I am, I have. And that is to reduce the reliance we have on passwords every day. We rely on these passwords to keep our data safe. And 
what they did is they created a protocol called the FIDO protocol. And that protocol allows the user to authenticate without a password, but with a FIDO compliant device. Example of that is a YubiKey. A YubiKey, which works via USB, and can be plugged into a laptop or a phone, and with that, authenticate the user without a password. And here we already see two of those factors. One, something they own, the YubiKey. And the second one is something that they know, as once you uh, plug this into your laptop, it will ask for a PIN code. Now, there are two problems with this protocol, though. The first one is that these YubiKeys aren't cheap. And the second one is, is that um, the um, uh, using that uh, YubiKey is uh, not supported everywhere, or at least this protocol is non isn't broadly supported. So we're asking our users to buy something expensive and then not being able to use it everywhere. So what they did is they came up with a new solution and they sat together with a few companies. And the first thing they did is they had to come up with a, a very original new name for their protocol the FIDO2 protocol. And they sat together with a lot of companies, but four companies, st well, stand out. These four. Can anybody tell me what these four companies have in common? Money, Money yeah, of course. <laughs> Browsers, exactly they have created the four major browsers we use here every day. And with that, they said, how about we tackle one of those problems? The problem that it isn't supported on every platform. So what did they do? They created a specification together with the W3C to make sure that it's available in these four major browsers. And with that, creating a huge audience because <laughs> what device doesn't support a browser these days? And what they did is they created the web authentication specification. And this specification is uh, now built into the browsers for the front end to invoke and to start the authentication process for a user. And this is also the specification that you can implement on your server side to, of course, um, register and verify users. Now, this specification has two major components. The first one is that it's now an open standard. And as I already previously mentioned with single sign-on solutions, a standard makes it that we have libraries, SDKs, or even out-of-the-box solutions that we can just enable with a click of a button. So with that, we create an easy way for developers to enable this specification. The other, and maybe even more important thing, is that it's based on public key cryptography. Something that, when a user registers, a public and private key pair is created. And the important thing there is that the private key will stay on the device of the user. So we're not sharing our secret anymore. So, what this means is that once the user registers, it gives the public key to the server. And once the user authenticates, the device will sign a piece of data, create a signature, and only send that signature over to the server. And the server can then validate that signature with the public key, because the public and private key have a mathematical relationship with each other. This is a very old technique. We've been using this since 1970. We're using this for SSH to gain access to our Linux machines. We even use this every day when we go to an HTTPS website. So with that, again, something common and something very secure. Now, the other part of the FIDO2 protocol is called the Client to Authenticator protocol. 
And this is a protocol that we as developers don't really need to care about as we're not directly interacting with it. But it is a very important part because what it does is it um, does the communication between the browser and all of the authenticators that are supported now. And authenticators that are supported can be either via USB, NFC, or Bluetooth. So things that are nearby. And there are two types of authenticators. The first one is platform authenticators. So platform authenticators are authenticators that are built into the device. So for instance, my phone has a fingerprint scanner and a camera for facial recognition. But laptops, of course, also have cameras and most newer models also have fingerprint scanner. And with this, we're also solving the other issue that we saw with the first protocol, namely something that we have to buy in addition to what we already have. So we don't have to buy a expensive YubiKey anymore. We only have to have an expensive phone. But you know, we already have that. And the other type of authenticators are roaming authenticators. So we can still use those YubiKeys that we might have bought, but a roaming authenticator can also again be a phone. Let me explain that one. Let's say you have a laptop and that laptop doesn't have the capabilities of a camera or a fingerprint scanner, but you still want to, you want to log in via your laptop. What you can then do is delegate the authenticator to your phone via the client to authenticator protocol. And with that, use the authenticator options on your phone to authenticate on your laptop. All right, let's look at some implementation and some code. So if you have your own identity provider or your own way of authenticating, how do you start with this? How do you implement this? So what we're gonna look at is uh, a simple website where you can register an account and then authenticate with that account. The flow is as follows. We have the client, of course, the browser, which will go to the server and says, hey, I want to register this user with a username, just like we do right now with a registration process. But we, of course, omit the password. At that point, the server, which will have um, implemented the web authentication specification, will create a object, a JSON object with a lot of data in it. And one of those fields in that data is a challenge. And this challenge is there to prevent replay attacks. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Now, this whole JSON object will be sent back to the browser. And the only thing the front end actually has to do is retrieve that object and pass it over to the web authentication API that is now available in all these major browsers. And at that point, the browser already takes over. So natively, these browsers will pop up with a screen and will show you, hey, what authenticator do you want to use? The user does its thing, performs a ceremony, for instance, their fingerprint. And at that point, the public private key pair is generated. And with that, the private key stays on the device and the public key is sent over to the server. And the server can then store that public key with the user's account. All right, code. So what I did here is I used one of the libraries that are already available. So all of the complexity is actually taken out. Um, so what we first do is we create a relying party identity. And here we actually provide a domain that the application is, um, is running on. Now, why do we do that? It's to prevent phishing attacks. So with this, we couple the domain to the key pair that is going to be generated. You can kind of compare it to when you use a password manager, when you provide a username, a password, and you also define the domain where that username and password can be used. It's also there to protect you, to make sure that if you, for some reason, get to a, uh, a phishing site that looks exactly like Google, you won't be able to prefill your password. Same concept here. The second thing is we create um, a relying party 
uh, instance, which is the instance that we will be using throughout this demo to call the registration and the authentication parts. And here we also give a implementation of the credential repository. Now this is just a specific thing for this library, but what it does is it allows you to implement your own way to store and retrieve public keys to whatever data store you prefer. The next thing is the user's identity. So here we provide the username of the, of the user and also create a random ID for that user, which will also be coupled to that private key pair. We then create the options where we provide that user and we call the start registration method on the relying party instance. And with that, the whole object is created that the front end will need to pass over to the web authentication API in the browser. So what do we do? We of course create a, of course create a JSON. And the result looks like this. So we have our domain that we specified. We have our user with that random ID. And we have a challenge. So again, complexity is taken away from us. These libraries do that for us. So this is a challenge that the front end will need to provide again once they have done the registration. And the other part is that we here can specify the algorithms that we're going to support. The more algorithms you specify, the more authenticators you will support. And last, we have a timeout, which just specifies how long a user can take to um, perform the whole authenticator process. Now, let's switch over to the front end. So in the front end, the only thing we do is, of course, we first do a call to the back end to receive that object we just saw. And the only thing they do is call the navigator credentials.create, which is the web authentication specification that is now available in these browsers. We pass over the object, and at that instance, immediately the browser takes over, and with that, the user can perform the whole thing. Once they're done, the web event JSON object will contain all the information that the server needs to store the public key. So we just do that. We call the backend. Switching over to the backend again, we receive that object, and of course we first parse it so that we have an object to work with. And then we have the uh, finish registration method that we need to call. But what we do here is we provide the request and the response, because of course we can never trust our front ends. And with this, we can validate the challenge that we have sent over to the front end and also the response that they gave. And as you see here, we don't have to do any complex stuff. We just call this method and if it doesn't give us any exceptions, we can retrieve the public key and store it however we want. Now, the authentication process. So here the user wants to sign in and the server again will create a JSON object. But this time it will have some additional fields, which I'll show you in a bit. The client will then again, of course, pass that over to the web authentication API and with that trigger the authenticators again. But there's a difference. The server will respond with the types of authenticators that this user has registered. And this means that you can register multiple authenticators. So you can register your, your laptop, your phone, or even a YubiKey. And with that, you will get the exact options that you have registered. And if you have one, it will default immediately to that one for a nice user experience. So of course, again, the user does, does its thing. We sign um, to, uh, to get the signature. The signature is sent over to the server and the server already has that public key so it can verify the signature and decide is this user properly identified. In code, we again use the uh, relying party instance, but this time we call the start assertion and we provide only the username of the user that wants to authenticate. And here we again see a bit of the library where it will 
uh, under the hood call one of the implementations that you have provided to gather the authenticators and the public keys of this user. And then, of course, we create a JSON object of that again. And this is the result. So again, the challenge, the uh, relying party uh, domain that we previously defined. And here we see the authenticators that have been registered for this user. So here we only see one, but as you can see, it's an array, so it can be multiple ones. And again, the timeout. Switching back to the front end again, we of course call the backend first with the username. We get that object that we just saw. And this time we call the navigators credentials.get. And this will invoke the authentication process. Again, the browser natively pops up with the dialog. The user performs its ceremony and is probably authenticated. And then the credential parameter will have everything again that has to be sent back to the backend, which we do right here. Switching back to the backend again, we get the response, and this time we call the parse assertion response to have an object again, and call after that the finish assertion, where again, we provide the request and the response to make sure that the challenge is right and to prevent replay attacks. And with that, we can uh, call one of these getters to see is this successful and retrieve the username of that user. Now, I've shown you how you can implement this if you have your own authentication server. But, of course, we all know that there are identity providers out there that we can use of the box solutions like Okta, of 0 Azure Active Directory, Amazon Cognito. But there are also open source products like Keycloak. Who here has heard of Keycloak? Wow, that's great. Okay, for the ones who don't know, Keycloak is an open source uh, identity and access management system that also provides things like single sign-on and uh, is also based on all these standards like uh, uh, OAuth, OpenID Connect, and yeah, we also use that a lot in our projects as it just makes sure that we don't reinvent the wheel every time again. It's a product that we can use to, um, yeah, to create a proper authentication for our websites. And as I mentioned, the FIDO protocol is now an open standard. So that means that also Keycloak, already for quite some time actually, has out-of-the-box support for this. So the only thing you have to do is click some checkboxes and you have it enabled. That's how easy it can be. And that is exactly what I did. So I set up a Keycloak instance, I enabled it, and I want to go through some use cases to show you how easy it actually is for this user to perform these things. So the first use case I want to highlight is I want to log in on my laptop on a website and I'm going to use the authenticator of or the capabilities of my device. So the platform authenticators. So here we have Keycloak. I'm going to provide my username. And you'll see immediately that I have multiple authenticators attached to this account. So I have my YubiKey, I have my phone and I have Windows Hello. Now, Windows Hello is um, comparable to Touch ID and Face ID on MacBooks. And with this, it uses the capabilities of my laptop, so my camera or my fingerprint scanner. So it will default immediately to that one, but this wouldn't be a demo if I didn't have an exception in it. What we see here is it reverts back to my PIN code. Why does it do that? It's because I don't have a fancy laptop. I don't have a fingerprint scanner. And for some reason, my camera is not supported by Windows Hello. But that doesn't mean I can't use it. This is comparable to your phone. If your fingerprint scanner doesn't work, 
And you're like, okay, fine. What do, you, what do you do then? You provide your pin code or that pattern that Android has. The same concept applies here. So what I want to show you is that even though you don't have any fancy laptop, you can still use this. And then I might hear you think, well, aren't we then again using a phrase, a, pa a password that we can forget? Well, that's true. But the thing is that is very different from a password is that this pin code that I'm now going to provide is never going to go to the server. It is only there to verify my identity, to verify that I am actually using this laptop. And the only thing it does is it unlocks that private key to sign, to create a signature and send over to the server. So let's provide my pin code and that's it. I'm logged in. Now, another example. I indeed don't have a special laptop and I also don't want to forget my pin code, because I will. So what do I do is I'm going to delegate the authenticator to my phone. And um, I made a, a video of that. So on the right side, you'll see my laptop and on the left, you'll see my phone. And you'll actually see that I'm first going to register my phone and make it sure that it trusts my laptop and vice versa. And that is done with the client to authenticator protocol. Let's have a look. So first I'm going to do the registration and of course no password. And once I click on the register button, it will now pop up natively from the browser what I want to use. So here I choose uh, that I want to add a phone. So this is a one-time thing that you have to do with your laptop and your phone. It doesn't need to be done on every site. So here you see the FIDO um, URL that is generated from the QR code. Here it will ask me to turn on the Bluetooth as that is one of the communications that this protocol allows. And with that, it will pop up and say, hey, give me your fingerprint and we're done. And we can give a nice name to it to make sure that if we log in, we see which authenticators we have registered on this account. Now, of course, for the authentication part, what we will see is that the phone will receive a push notification as Bluetooth is still on. And with that, it will automatically default to the fingerprint scanner as that is the only uh, authenticator I have now available on my device. So there you see the push notification. I click on it and immediately it will give me the fingerprint option I provide it and I'm logged in. Next one is a very familiar use case, of course. We're on our phone and we want to log in. Easy as that. So again here, we register an account and what you'll see is that it will natively pop up um, the dialog, but then this time it's Chrome that will do that. And I will also again have some options. So here you will see the options. And uh, with that, you'll see that I can also use, for instance, a YubiKey. But I'm going to use for my fingerprint, of course, because that's easy. And again, we can provide a name for the authenticator that we have done. So I provide that and I'm registered. That's how easy it can be. And of course, again, here to show you that it will automatically pop up with the fingerprint. We provide our username. We'll see that that's the only authenticator. We sign in, fingerprint, provide it, and we're logged in. So, I want to ask all of you as users, look at the accounts that you have and see if this protocol is already supported by the website. Because as you can see, this is a really easy way to authenticate. You don't have to remember anything anymore. And to give you a tip, GitHub already supports this. So go have a look. 
And now me talking to you as developers. Go to your product owners, go to your clients and tell them how easy this will be for their end users. And I'm not telling you to say, hey, we should abandon all passwords immediately because I know that that is not going to happen. But the nice thing about this is that this can also be applied as a second step in your authentication process. So we'll still have passwords, but we can have this as a second step, which is way more secure than these one-time passwords, as these things cannot be triggered by phishing attacks. And for any malicious parties in this room, I want to wish you very good luck with stealing those public keys. And with that, I thank you. I want to mention two things. One is, uh, if you want to know more, you can actually go to the webauthent.io, not created by us, um, and you can actually um, just do a demo. You can register your phone with a demo account and you can see how it works on your phone, for instance. And if you want to really get into the nitty-gritty details of how this specification works, you can go to uh, webauthent.guide. And I also want to give a quick shout out to my colleague, uh, which I would actually be co-hosting this with, uh, but he unfortunately couldn't make it. So shout out to Lucien as well. Again, thank you. <laughs>